Is internet is not working? Okay. Yes. So uh, as I was counting on him to introduce uh, very very convenient this, uh, <laughs> uh, as I was uh, counting on Gerson to introduce Ismael, I will do my best. I have I have here. Uh, let me see where is that. I have here his uh, lots open, so I can I can talk a little bit. Uh, well, he he did his uh, undergrad in uh, Universidade Federal de Goiás in Catalão. Uh, he spent uh, two semesters at uh, La Sapienza in in Rome. Uh, we were talking about that. The, he had a lot of fun there. I can imagine. Uh, he. And he did his uh, his uh, undergrad, uh, no, his masters in Uberlândia, and now he's uh, doing his PhD with uh, Professor Gerson uh, here in Uberlândia too. Uh, and he has some. Uh, he he did. Uh, he graduated also in. Uh, in statistics, right? At uh, Uberlândia. No, yeah. no, I actually I, I stopped it because of the time. I just started, but then I stopped it. Oh, uh, okay. So he, yeah. so let's say that he has a minor in statistics and a major in uh, right. in uh, physics, and he now is doing uh, his. Oh, Jarvis is back. So uh, yeah. No, you can finish because I'm checking my internet connection, please. Okay, okay. So, uh, and uh, so welcome, Ismael. I am glad you accepted to give the talk. Although I know you would be you would be in trouble with your advisor <laughs> if you didn't. So, uh, Ismael is going to talk about spin drift diffusion for two subband quantum wells. No. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, Professor George. Uh, so as he said, I, I'm a local student, and this work we've been doing for a while. Actually, started out with my master thesis with Professor Gerson, where I was supposed to get familiar with uh, non-equilibrium rings functions uh, because our goal was to work uh, carry out some calculations for the spin diffusion equation. And well, uh, thanks, Professor George, as well, because he was in my defense of my master thesis. Uh, I, when I finished and I started my PhD here, also with uh, Professor Gerson, we continued working, and I, I spent uh, the first year of my PhD working on this uh, equation. And uh, we just uh, this is actually some somewhat a, a special talk because this is my first work ever that I'm I'm part of uh, and just uh, the day before yesterday I got accepted and, and you know, we already have the the uh, the paper on archive so you guys can check out so uh, as the title says uh, I'm going to be talking about a model that we developed uh, for two sub band quantum wells and this work has been done with uh, my advisor, Professor Gerson, and also with uh, Professor Roberto Raimondi from University of Roma Tre in Italy. And well, we've been working this past uh, crazy year. Okay, so uh, this is uh, just an overview of what I will be, uh, will be talking about. I, I will uh, talk about some of the motivation. I'm also going to be talking about, uh, just to throw at you some equations that uh, perhaps uh, you cannot even make sense of them, but it's just because uh, we do some important approximations and then uh, it's uh, I have to, to talk about that. And luckily, Gershon is here, so he understands way better than me what I do. So if you have any questions, uh, you can address either to me or Gershon. Uh, we can make this a very uh, informal talk. Uh, okay, so uh, the research I've been doing here with Professor Gerson is uh, researching spintronics. And a good example of uh, the goals of this field is uh, the spin transistor. So uh, one of the challenges of this uh, device is to control spin. So uh, what we want, we, we want to be able to control 
this being polarization from one point uh, to another. And, and it was first proposed by uh, Daradazi in 1990. And actually this one is ballistic. And, and then in 2003, uh, X, uh, Loss and, and Schumann, they propose a non-ballistic uh, spin transistor. That's the one we think. I'm just using this, uh, this picture here to exemplify it. So as I've been talking about our system, we account the, the spin orbit effect. And one of the consequences of this is, well, uh, you want to be able to control your spin. And when you add spin orbit, uh, the spin orbit effect will create a what we call effective precession vector. And for some regime, this uh, effector, this precession vector is going to be perpendicular to the momentum direction. And what we can see is that uh, the spin will process around it. And well, a spin orbit, as I, I, I talk soon, it, you can control it. And therefore, you, you might think that you're done with the problem. You, you can control spin orbit. Therefore, you can control the kind of control the precession vector. Then you can, uh, therefore, con uh, control the spin polarization. But actually, adding spin orbit uh, comes with a price because um, if we think at, as a system with impurities, and here uh, throughout this work, we will consider uh, scalar impuri impurities. Uh, after many scaling events, uh, the precession vector itself uh, becomes random, and then you have a spin decay, and you lose control of your system. And that's something you don't want. And, and this effect is called the diakonov Perel spin relaxation. There are other mechanisms of uh, spin relaxation, but the one we consider here in this work is the diakonov Perel. Now, the question then is, OK, I, I add spin orbit, but the price I pay is that we have a spin decay. And so you might ask, well, uh, is there something I can do to make this lifetime, this spin lifetime bigger? And well, this is what we, we try to do. Uh, so our system, we think has uh, in a quantum well. And uh, for the first slides, I'll be thinking of a quantum well just with uh, one subband occupied. So I am just considering uh, one solution here of the, the quantum well, one wave function. And in this kind of system, uh, there's uh, two types of spin orbit that we consider. This, uh, we consider the dresser house in orbit coupling. It comes from the, the crystal inversion asymmetry. And the other is the Hashba spin orbit coupling. It comes from the structural, structural inversion asymmetry. It basically, it means that if you apply a magnetic field here, uh, if you apply an electrical field here in the, the quantum well, it becomes crooked. And as it uh, becomes uh, a little crooked, it gives rise to this Rashba uh, effect. And also uh, for the, if we plot a, 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 a 2D, 2D of the, the energy dispersion, then we have these parabolas here that we call the, the subbands. And if we have a, in our case, what we, uh, we did for two subband quantum miles, then we have uh, two subbands. And also this uh, spin orbit coupling, Hashba, it creates uh, a, a spin, uh, a split here of the, the, the subbands, uh, but uh, I'll talk about this later. Okay, uh, so as I said before, we, we want to control spin, and uh, people started to notice from after the, the, the paper, or even before actually, the paper from eggs of the non uh, ballistic spin transistor, that uh, there's a regime where you can make the spin orbit coupling strengths equal. Uh, so we have here the strength for the, the Hashba coupling, uh, we uh, would just call alpha, and for the dresser house uh, beta. And there's a regime where you make them equal to each other in strength, only changing by a sign, that you can think of, uh, if you think of the, at that uh, effective magnetic uh, field in, in a Fermi circle, you can picture as these arrows here that when you combine them, some of them cancel and you have what it's called the Unioxo regime. Uh, basically, uh, what happens here is uh, what Bernardic showed us in 2016, that it, well, the spin orbit breaks the SU2 symmetry of the, the, the system, meaning that the spin operator won't commute with the Hamiltonian. 
And at this regime, when you make these guys equal, uh, you are able to recover the symmetry here. And therefore, uh, and then you can show that the spin will commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, this, this means that the spin is a conserved quantity. And they also show that there's this Q vector, this displacement vector that depends on the, the spin orbit string. And it basically creates a, a, a rotation operator that uh, for the spin polarization, it will only depend on, uh, on this vector and uh, the, the position. And the, the product of this is going to be a wave of spin that we call the persistent spin helix. Uh, so basically, uh, as the, the electron moves, the, it doesn't depend on its momentum. The polarization will only depend on its position. And you can get some very nice uh, spin patterns of this. Uh, as uh, Korolek in 2009 was the first to, to measure. And then this picture is uh, from uh, Balser and, and Sally's in 2012, where uh, they, they use a, a technique that they can measure the persistent spin helix. And you get this, uh, because it's a wave, you get this stripe patterns of spin where the red will be all the, the, the spin density in that position, all, all of them have a spin polarization down and the blue would be up, for example. And the other consequence of this is that the, 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 the spin lifetime is infinite. infinite. And, and well, this is good because you want to be able to control the polarization. In practice, it's not because there are another uh, part of the dressel house spin orbit coupling that will make uh, a, that will create a spin decay. However, uh, you are able to, to have a robust dynamics for the spin polarization here. But this is for only one subband quantum well, and it's very well established. There's a lot of in the literature about this. And what we want to do is advance this. Now, for two subband quantum wells, there aren't many papers out there, uh, but Perhaps one of the most important is this one from Fu and Eggs uh, from 2016, where they consider a, a two subband quantum well. Now, uh, for two subbands, each subband will have uh, a its own spin orbit string, so alpha one, beta one, and alpha two, and beta two. And what he predicted was that uh, in the case where you have these uh, these spin orbit strings. Uh, from equal strength but a different sign, each, each subband is in, is in uh, persistent spin helix. I would just call it PSH and, and persistent skewing lattice PSL. So when this happens, uh, if, if, for example, the alpha equals beta one creates a vertical strike pattern, the alpha equals to minus beta one will create a horizontal stripe patterns of spin. Now, if you combine these two in each subband, they, 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 they determine there's a, a coherent superposition of this persistent spin helix. And then you get this, uh, what they call the check, checkerboard pattern, like a chess pattern. And what we do is, okay, so uh, let's build a diffusion equation to check how the spin polarization will evolve. And then we will check uh, for the, the, the PSL regime, if we can get the, the, this, these crossed patterns of spin. All right, uh, so to build our model, let's start, of course, with the, the Hamiltonian. So this is the, the, the Hamiltonian. And, uh, one of the first approximations we do that is that we work in the non-degenerate regime, meaning that these off-diagonal elements, they are uh, way uh, smaller than uh, the energy difference between the subbands. And it, as a consequence of this, the, the Fermi circles, they, they do not overlap, so we can neglect these off-diagonal elements here. And then we just have these Hamiltonian, these diagonal parts of the Hamiltonian. And this is our Hamiltonian. We have the in-plane electrical field, the, the, the spin orbit Hamiltonian, and we carry here the J, that is the subband index for, well, for each part of the Hamiltonian. 
Uh, okay, then we are considering the linear dresser house and also the cubic uh, dresser house. Term. So uh, we started this work from scratch. We started from the Boltzmann equation, and well, this equation is it's an equation for the the distribution function, and we have the left hand side that is responsible for the cinetic terms of uh, our system, and the challenge is to compute the what we call the collision integral. This part accounts for the interaction. And uh, well, uh, for those that are familiar with uh, Green's functions, here we, we have the, the Keldish component of the Green's functions. And here's the, the spectral function. And these guys here, they are um, written in terms of these functions. Uh, therefore, what we have to do is to find the self energy and then uh, go back and, and, and uh, derive the collision integral and then from that i'm not going to go into detail how you do this but you go from the boltzmann equation to a, a spin diffusion equation all right so our self energy in the self consistent born approximation uh it gets its usual uh, basically mean that the diagram we're counting is the one where this this one here is the the full propagator and it's average uh, over the, the impurities. And so you get uh, what one that is familiar would expect, the, the impurity density, the impurity potential. But uh, for us, uh, we get also this, this thing is weighted of this quantity here, lambda. And this quantity, it gives you the overlap of the wave functions, either, either uh, inter or intra subband. But an important quantity here that we define is this one. We call it uh, the overlap ratio between these uh, this overlap densities uh, regarding to the first subband. So uh, basically what it gives me is that when, you when we have a symmetric quantum well, so we have a big overlap here of the wave functions. Uh, but as you, you add a field there, the... the um, the quantum well will become crooked, and then the wave functions they will localize in each part of, of the, the quantum well, and then there's no overlap. So this quantity here it, it will show us the overlap. Uh, the one that I should call your attention is this one, uh, the intercept band coupling. So uh, when we have a symmetric quantum well, uh, we have a big overlap here of the wave functions, then this quantity is, uh, is, is big, is, is the highest value. And as we increase the field and they will become, the, the quantum well becomes crooked, then the intercept band coupling goes, goes to zero. Basically means that uh, since we don't have this overlap, it will become more difficult for the electron to scatter from one subband to the other. This, this will have some implications to, to the dynamics. Okay. Uh, so another important approximation we do, we consider a, a small soft limit, so that this spin orbit is, is small. This allows us to write the spectral function as, uh, well, the first term here is, uh, is the usual in the quasi-particle approximation, so it's the delta function. Uh, uh, the difference is that we can expand this function and have a first order correction here in, in the spin orbit. So we have two terms of the collision integral. The first one is in the, the relaxation time approximation. And the second uh, term is just a correction here on, uh, on the spin orbit. But uh, then we, we come up with, with uh, some important quantities. That is the, the spin relaxation of inter and intra subbands, because uh, here we have different indexes for each subband. And then we also have the momentum relaxation. Uh, this guy here basically gives you the time scale between the, the scattering, uh, uh, how, how long will take uh, uh, between the scattering events. And this also plays a, a fundamental role in the dynamics. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and throw at you some this huge equation. Actually, it's bigger than that. I, I just uh, simplified a little uh, in order uh, to just discuss some main terms. We will be doing a lot of qualitative analysis here. This equation you cannot, we weren't able to solve it analytically, just for a few cases, as I will show you. 
But uh, the important thing is that well, we have here the, the spin diffusion equation, it's Fourier transform, so it's in the reciprocal space. We have a, a component vector here where we account for charge densities of each subband and also the three spin components of each subband. But the important thing is that those overlap ratios, they, they couple these densities and then, well, things become more complicated. But uh, however, we are still able to recover uh, the, 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 the right diffusion matrix. And it has that familiar face of uh, where in the diagonal terms, we have the, the diaconov diaconov Perel spin relaxation times is pretty similar to, uh, to what you get in one subband. Here, these Q vectors, well, it's just a bunch of terms, but in the end, they will just depend on the, the spin orbit streams. We also define the uh, subband relaxation rate, uh, the total uh, uh, spin relaxation, that is the sum of the overlap ratios, and we get the, the usual diffusion equation, the usual diffusion coefficient. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, complicated, so let's uh, just uh, do some qualitative analysis here. Uh, the first thing we can define is actually a uh, two regimes. Uh, uh, this is the limits of, of what we are working on. So remember, we, we have a symmetric quantum level, and then it, we can apply a field, and, and it becomes crooked. So uh, when it's symmetric, those overlap ratios, they are approximately one, as I showed you before. And in this case, if we go back to the diffusion equation, and we make this guy, those guys equal more or less equal to one. What we notice is that uh, these subbands, they, they become an average, the, the, the densities, they become an average, and also the, the diffusion matrix become an average. So uh, the way you can picture this is, uh, well, uh, there's a, in this case, near the, the isotropic uh, quantum well, there's a big overlap of the wave functions. And therefore, the, the electron is jumping between subbands really fast. And so it, he's not able to say, okay, I'm now in the first subband, or okay, now I'm the second subband. Sub Instead, he will feel uh, just an average of these two subbands. You will feel the, the average of these dynamics. And, and well, you can picture this as a, a random box. So the, there's a lot of uh, jumping between the subbands until that. Uh, it feels just the average. And actually, Gerson wrote a paper with a random walk model in, in 2017 that, well, if you're interested in it, you should check it out. It's a very elegant model. Now, we, we can go to the opposite limit, where the over the intercept band coupling is approximately zero. And in this case, uh, uh, the diffusion equation uh, it will become uh, these densities, they decouple. And we basically have a diffusion equation for independent subbands. And this has some uh, consequences because we can uh, well, work in these regimes and, and make some qualitative analysis of what's happening in these uh, dynamics. Uh, OK, another very important quantity that we use is what we call a average subband relaxation time. Uh, this. Uh, this I will call just TC, uh, it will give you uh, the time scale that will take for the, uh, the, the subband relax, uh, the dynamics relax to a, an average dynamics. So how long does it take for you, for the, this dynamics go to the strong coupling regime? And you can write an equation for this guy and it's approximately with this equation, we can actually define in which uh, coupling regime you are. So uh, if the time is way smaller than TC, then we are in the weak coupling. But if uh, time is way bigger than TC, we are in the strong coupling. And well, this guy, uh, it, will, it will go to, uh, you, it is linear here with uh, the, this is a log log plot. So it's linear here with uh, the intercept band coupling, and then as it approaches the value of uh, of uh, phi to zero, it will drop to zero. But what I, I perhaps most important is that well, this is a plot of the intercept band of the overlap ratios. Now, 
as you increase the field, so you start here with zero field, and then the intercept band coupling is uh, the highest. And as you increase the field, this value here drops, and then TC grows. Uh, it becomes a bigger. So for uh, for T much bigger than TC, we are in the strong coupling regime. And the thing is that this value here, usually for small fields, is uh, it's kind of big. And then TC is going to be small. So we expect that most of the time in an experimental setup, we will be in the, the strong coupling version. So uh, from the diffusion equation, we, we, we have these two regimes now and we can make some analysis. All right, as for uh, analytical solutions, uh, well, that equation is kind of complicated. So we are actually able, if we neglect the, the charge densities, we are able to find analytical solutions. And, and there are analytical solutions when we are in the PSH regime and the isotropic regime where those vectors, they are equal. Now, uh, with the analytical solutions, again, I, I, just, I will just show you the result. We can write a, a, an equation for the spin lifetime, but uh, this equation has two faces. Uh, it will depend on each uh, regime we are. So uh, if we are in the weak coupling, then the cell bands, they, they move independently. And then you compute the, the spin lifetime where these quantities here, they are just the individual quantities of each subband. Now, if you are in the strong coupling regime, then these quantities here, they are, as I said before, they are an average of the, the diffusion coefficients from each subband and the Q vectors and uh, an average of the spin uh, lifetimes due to the Akhanov curl. Okay. Um, so, we adapted this code from Gerson PhD and also from uh, Fu, from the paper of uh, the persistent skin and lattice, where they are able to simulate this quantum well. And uh, this, this code provides us with the weight functions, the eigenvalues. Uh, the spin orbit uh, strings, where as you vary the field, as you vary the, the barrier or the, the size of the, the quantum well. And then uh, we can simulate here a 38 nanometer quantum well with a central barrier of uh, 0 0.5 nanometers. And we have this, uh, this density of carries here. And since that diffusion equation is a, um, a uh, differential equation, we need uh, some initial conditions to, to solve it. So what we do is uh, we simulate this uh, experiment that is called the time result carry rotation, where they pump uh, the sample with uh, a, a, a circular polarized light, and then uh, they excite, say, the, the z-polarization just in a small point that you consider that at a time t, uh, the, the density of spins in the z-direction uh, at that position they are just a delta. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. So uh, with the spin lifetime, then we are able uh, now to analyze how it will behave the lifetime in each uh, regime. Now uh, let's start with the weak coupling regime. Now uh, here we can look at uh, small fields, and for one subband case. So here we look at a PSH in the first subband. So as I vary the, the field, I look for points where alpha one is equal to beta one. And I can see here that for small fields, indeed the lifetime, the spin lifetime peak will be here uh, in, uh, in the PSH point. However, uh, so here for small fields, the first subband will dominate, but as you increase the field, then the subband, the second subband starts to, to, to dominate. And the thing is here that, well, uh, yes, if you take a small field, then you kind of have a peak here in the, the, the PSH regime. But as you increase the field, here we also have a PSH regime. 
Uh, now, the problem is that we don't have a, a lifetime peak here. And this is due actually because uh, the, the spin lifetime is proportional to one over this quantity here uh, where we have the Quebec Dresser House squared. And if we look at here, for small fields, this guy is content, constant. And then, okay, we, we do have a spin lifetime peak near the, the PSH regime. But as you increase the field, uh, then this quantity varies a lot and starts to dominate. And, and then the lifetime peak is shifted. And this is the, the weak coupling regime. Now we can uh, make some analysis on the strong coupling regime. Now, again, in the strong coupling, uh, the subbands, they, they behave uh, as an average. And well, you can plot the, the spin lifetime, the analytical solution, as an uh, average here. And I forgot to mention that that line is uh, the numerical solution from the full diffusion equation. And it matches uh, really well with the, the, the analytical solution for both regimes. And now for the strong coupling regime, what is interesting is that, well, there's a lifetime, the spring lifetime peak here near the isotropic limit. And what we can see here is that, well, what changes drastically near this isotropic uh, part is the intercept band coupling. And uh, for the analytical solutions, we can see that the, the spring lifetime is proportional to one over, actually one plus uh, the intercept band coupling. And this quantity will vary from zero to more or less one. And, and as you increase this from zero to more or less one to the isotropic, or if you go from the, the isotropic to, to a higher field, then uh, this, uh, this, this spin of time will drop by a, qualitatively by a factor of two, considering that all, all the other things uh, that uh, the spin of time depends upon remains the same. So this is an interesting finding. And as you can see, the, the results, um, uh, the analytical results from our approximation uh, matches pretty well with the numerical. All right, I'm gonna jump this uh, part and I'm gonna go straight to the persistent skin and lattice. Uh, okay, so uh, here we simulate the, the um, the well from uh, Ag's paper from 2016. And there they have a 45 nanometer quantum well, then there's a, a bigger uh, central barrier and a lower density of carriers. Now, we have to be careful a little bit uh, with our model because uh, if we look here at the system, uh, here we plotted the, the difference, uh, the energy difference between the subbands and it's lowest here, of course, in the isotropic limit. Now, uh, uh, for us to be in the non-degenerate regime, we need that this energy difference is uh, bigger than H bar divided by tau zero. Now, uh, we usually we would uh, take uh, tau zero as one picosecond, but in this case, say that we you are looking at our model at uh, zero field, then uh, here the energy difference is. Uh, yeah, uh, you can actually compute how much tau zero has to be in order for the non-degenerate regime to be valid. And in this case, for zero field, uh, we needed tau zero bigger than two, about five uh, picoseconds. Now, uh, but since here in the system, this four nanometer quantum well system, we are interesting in the interested in, in uh, persistent skin and lattice point. Uh, this will happen when uh, the field is, is happens at this field here. And in this case, uh, here, uh, the energy difference is uh, more or less 0 0.75 million atom volts. And this requ require us that we, we should use uh, uh, tau zero bigger than uh, 0 0.8 picoseconds. So uh, if tau zero is bigger than that, uh, we should be uh, fine working with our model and we're not swimming in dangerous waters. All right. Okay, uh, like, like I said, uh, the, the PSL, it, it happens when each subband is in uh, a persistent, um, persistent spin helix. And okay, uh, so 
it will happen when alpha one is equal to beta one or alpha two is equal to minus beta two. And what Bernevik showed us is that uh, for the PSH, uh, uh, the system is, uh, the dynamics is robust against the impurity scaling, meaning that the, the Hamiltonian wheel can mute with uh, spin. Now, the question remains whether the PSL is gonna be the same. And we can do some uh, simple analysis to check if this dynamics is robust. And we consider again a total Hamiltonian, total 2D Hamiltonian. And we have the impurity potential here projected in the subdiamond indexes. And we assume that, of course, the diagonal here is the usual PSA regime. And then these guys are, uh, have a robust dynamics. Uh, so what we commentator with uh, this spin operator is zero. So we consider a, we can consider a generic uh, spin operator. And well, then if you try to compute this, this Hamiltonian, you get this guy here. And this is gonna be robust when uh, these guys are parallel. Basically, this uh, we would require that alpha one is equal to beta one and alpha two is equal to plus beta two. And then they are parallel. I can think as just uh, strike patterns of spin for both subbands. Now, uh, in the case of the, P the PSL, these guys, they are orthogonal and therefore they are, not dif they are different. Now, the only way that this here then could be uh, robust is if the impurity uh, intercept band coupling is approximately zero. And this is true in the weak coupling limit because, well, we have uh, the, the crooked uh, quantum well and then TC is large. And then the, there is no, there actually there aren't many scatter, scattering between the subbands. The, the electron, electron won't be jumping between subbands a lot. Uh, so it, the subbands will evolve independently in this regime. And then in fact, we have a, a robust dynamics. Uh, also, uh, one thing we can look at is that uh, how how does the, the spin up time behave? We would expect that uh, it follows a diaconal parallel uh, trend, uh, so it should be proportional to one over tau zero. And we can run here for a few electrical fields and, and, and check this trend here. So we, since we are plotting here uh, the spin lifetime uh, with uh, one over tau zero, so we start with a high tau zero and then we go to a lower tau zero. And in the zero field, we are always here with TC very small. Therefore, we are in a strong coupling regime. And so we get this trend uh, full time. Uh, as you vary tau zero, uh, you get this diagonal parallel trend all the way. Now, if as you if you are in another uh, field here, then things become more complicated. But as uh, if I have a large tau zero, that is a small one over tau zero, of course, then it follows some sort of a linear trend here. And, and here we are in the weak coupling regime. And then as we lower tau zero or increase one over tau zero, we start going to the strong coupling. And in between this, uh, this, uh, these regimes, now at, at, at a full strong uh, coupling, it follows the diaconal parallel trend. And then uh, you have a complicated dynamics here. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, the, the, the dashed line are, are the analytical solutions and these ones are the, the numerical solutions. So as you go to the, the weak coupling, then you get, uh, you, you come back to this uh, back to this uh, linear trend. So uh, uh, what what you can do is uh, first of all you can look at TC and you can uh, since TC is 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 a, a variable that we define in which dynamic which uh, regime we are. You can well increase TC by increasing tau zero or you can increase TC by lowering the intercept band couple. And therefore, since it, in the, the weak and the strong coupling, they follow this, 
Diakonov Borel of 1 over tau 0, we can define this quantity here, uh, tau s times tau 0, as a quantity that will give me the full limits uh, that we of the dynamics. Of the, there is the strong limit and the weak regime limit. Uh, I'll just go to the not other slides to better explain this. Uh, actually, so as I said before, we can uh, increase TC. Therefore, uh, if we increase TC, we go to the, the weak coupling. Uh, and, and then you can increase this by increasing tau zero. And then we check for the, 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 the PSL pattern. Now, if we have uh, tau zero equals to one picosecond, so TC is pretty small, it's uh, one picosecond. And so we are in the strong uh, coupling here, and the dynamics is uh, uh, kind of uh, circular because uh, the field is, is small. And you can then start going to the strong regime by increasing tau zero. And as we increase tau zero here for five picoseconds, the C is uh, 44 picoseconds. And we can see that the, the spin patterns, they start to become uh, they start to, to, to create that check, checkerboard pattern. And as you increase tau zero, you start going from the, the strong to the weak coupling. And if we make uh, uh, the intercept band coupling equals to zero, we are fully in the weak coupling limit. And then we not only get the spin pattern, but we also have, like I, talked, like I said before, we have a robust dynamics. And then we have this uh, PSL patterns. But I, I mentioned that, well, in real life, we expect that uh, most of the time we will be in this from coupling regime. And as we can see here, this uh, in this configuration, the strong coupling, uh, this uh, checkerboard uh, um, pattern is killed. So it only happens in the weak coupling. And therefore, well, uh, you can, uh, we don't expect that you, you, you would get these spin uh, uh, patterns for very long. All right, just uh, to finish here, uh, uh, 10 to 3. So, yeah, I, I hope you were able to understand the, more or less what we did. So, we, we, we build a model. For two sum bed quantum wells by considering a non degenerate regime for the, the, the sub band, meaning that the, the from the circles they do not overlap. And we had some interesting findings because with the diffusion equation, we were able to define some regimes where the dynamics is at. So, uh, one of the interesting things is the strong uh, regime where this, the, the, the sub bands they, be, they become an average of each other. And then the, there is a lifetime, uh, the spin lifetime peak near the isotropic limit due to these dynamics of the intercept band coupling. And you can go from these two regimes by either increasing tau zero or lowering uh, the intercept band coupling. And in these uh, limits, they follow a diakonov Perel trend. And as predicted by eggs in, in 2016, we are actually able to recover a, a robust dynamics for the, the persistent scaling lattice, uh, but it only happens uh, in the weak coupling regime. And as we I, I mentioned before, the typical values of uh, the intercept band coupling is kind of large, so therefore TC is small. And then we are in uh, most of the time we will be in the strong coupling regime. And well, this is uh, just the acknowledgments of the funding agencies, and, and well, thank you. George, está sem som. I, I can't hear you. So I, I can start by saying thanks to Ismael. Let me take uh, George's role now. So thanks for the, for the very nice talk, very interesting work, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank uh, you. 
I liked the presentation. It was quite good. So now let's open for, for questions. If anybody has questions, please uh, raise your hand and open the mic. Uh, feel free. Okay, apparently it was a very good talk. There is no questions. Actually, the contrary. I think it was a very bad talk because nobody understood even to make a good. Yeah, I, I think I, I spoke too fast, actually. Way faster no. than. Uh, well, I know the work, but it, for me, it was. Yeah, good. you don't count. Uh, yeah, I, I can't hear you yet, uh, George. I think we lost George now. Okay. Uh, I don't know if uh, we should wait for George to come back. He doesn't have WhatsApp or it's quite difficult to talk to him. <laughs> Let's wait for a bit. Well, I can make a question in the meantime. So what are the next steps? What, what are you going to do next? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, the problem here, as uh, I hope it was somewhat clear for some of you, is that we will build our model by considering a non-degenerate regime. So, well, the energy difference between the subbands are quite large. Now, it's uh, kind of difficult to work with the Green's functions when uh, this energy is different because then uh, you have to account for the off-diagonal elements of the, the Hamiltonian. And I think uh, most of the work from my PhD is going to be directed to this uh, project where we have to uh, develop uh, or improve the model for a non-degenerate regime. For the degenerate regime. Yeah, the generate region. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the generate regime will be easy, but the intermediate regime between full degenerate degeneracy and non degeneracy, the intermediate intermediate regime is going to be tough because then you cannot use the quasi particle approximation. Yeah. So well, I think they're back. George, can I hear yeah, you? Yeah, can, can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. 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 So, just an announcement if you are connected to this uh, service you cannot change the input you cannot change the microphone or i switch it to another one i thought it was working and it doesn't you I, have to go I, out and come back i i think it's your problem because i think yeah it, it's it doesn't it, help doesn't it it, have any problem i am sure it's my problem no, I think the problem in your view is... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am sure of that. Uh, I I have a question if anyone, if no one else has any, a question. You first. You first. I have yeah. one. Oh, so go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I, I have this, I have to leave for a, for a while, so I may have missed part of your talk. Probably missed some, but maybe you have spoke about what I, I, I will ask. By the way, it was a nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as far as I, I, I understood, you considered scaring by um, non-magnetic theory, right? Yes. So my question is what happens if you, if you consider spin degree of freedom of your impurities? Well, uh, if you consider, then uh, you have to account uh, for the idiotic effect uh, spin relaxation mechanism. So basically, you have another term in the, the collision integral. Uh, and then you, you have to work that, that term out for, for the diffusion equation. But yes, what there about, will be additional terms. What about robustness of the, of, of the, of the structure, spin structure you have? If it's going to be robust, uh, well, for, if it's going to be robust, Gerson, I, I haven't thought about it. Well, it's a good question. If you say robust in the sense that it commutes with the Hamiltonian, 
then, well, hmm, I guess not. If you have uh, magnetic impurities, probably already in the level of the commutator with the Hamiltonian, you're going to have some trouble already. So I, I, in reality, I did this calculation and I found mm. to my surprise, to my surprise, I found it commutes. It commutes. It commutes. Yeah. I was very surprised. I was sure it was not going to. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big, long calculation, but, uh, probably I because it's, if you consider random impurities, it preserves time reversal on average. Yeah. I did one, one impurity, one impurity. But okay, one impurity with spin orbit, but not magnetized. Uh, then it's uh, well, it's a quantum impurity. It's a spin one half. Okay. Well, but but may perhaps if you if you have a moving but, but see, so you may have some. This is for one one like quantum that. well. This is for one quantum well. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, but this is well known. I just I just. Um, I'm afraid to say anything about how robust it is in terms of the commutator, but as you already said, it commutes. But in practice, if you account for the Eliotti effect, uh, the main contribution will be extra terms in the diagonal of the diffusion equation that accounts for the Eliotti effect spin relaxation. Uh, and there are also some extra terms that leads to a coupling between spin and charge. But typically, these are small. And if you go, mm -hmm. if you go to real systems, uh, typically, the diakonov pedel terms are dominant over the Eliotti effect, unless you go to very clean systems. If the, the impurity density is very small, then diakonov pedel terms, uh, they, they, not, well, they, they become small, and then the Eliotti effect becomes more relevant. So the one grows and the other goes down. So in, in this sense, as Ismael was, in, in the end of the talk, he was increasing tau zero, and increasing tau zero means that he's going to a cleaner system. So for, for large tau zero, uh, um, which gives you the weak coupling limits, then the Eliotti effect may start to become relevant. So in, in the weak coupling, there could be some extra contributions. In the strong coupling, then then you are fine. I'm sure that Jack Nopinel dominates. Thank you. It's my, it may be a, a very complicated calculation, by the way, right? No, it's part of the plans for the PhD. It's a bit more complicated yeah. than the token out pedal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. since we have now two subbands, there's going to be a bunch of extra terms, but it's it's in the plans. So during the I period, repeat, I would I repeat my question the next talk then. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I you. Very able to answer. Uh, any more questions? Anyone? Um, yes, not. Well, the question I had is the question that uh, that Edson just asked, obviously. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I imagine. <laughs> sorry, yeah. sorry, George. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, uh, in the end, it, it's the same. Uh, so, um, if there are no other questions, we thank the speaker again. Very nice, very nice talk. Thank you. And uh, congratulations for the paper. Is it, uh, where, where was it accepted? PRB? PRB. Yes. PRB, very well, very well, very good. Yeah. And uh, very good. so I ask um, Ismael to send me, please, if he doesn't oppose that, to, oh, send, of course, the, yeah. to send the PDF so that we can, uh, once we get the page running, we have the PDFs there for people to download. Okay, I'll send you right away.